Hello, everybody. Welcome at this webinar organized by the Green European Foundation and Think Tank Oikos, which is titled Don't Just Look in the Mirror, Look at the System. Um, and so let me first uh, introduce to you the two speakers of today. First, uh, we have Julia Steinberg. She's professor of ecological economics at the University of Lausanne. She studies the relationships between the use of resources and performance of societies, researching how human well being can be realized within planetary boundaries. She is also a lead author of the IPCC. Next, uh, we have Jaap Tielbeke. He is environmental editor of the Dutch progressive magazine, The Groene Amsterdammer. And he also wrote recently the book uh, in Dutch, uh, The Myth of the Green Consumer. And so I think uh, their two contributions will be very complementary um, because, as we all know, last decade's growing affluence has led to an increased resource use and pollutant emissions. And this puts a specific responsibility on the shoulders of affluent citizens to which most of middle class of Western Europe belong. And a global just transition is only possible if we say farewell to ecological gluttony. Now, at the same time, it would be wrong to translate this insight in the first place into individual responsibility. As I always say, you can't eat healthy in a candy shop. And so also, if our economies and cultures incite overconsumption and inhibit, inhibit sustainable lifestyles, it's hard to change uh, your lifestyle. So how, for instance, to get rid of your car when there's no good public transport? And why would you change your diet when governments keep on promoting eating meat? So without denying individual responsibility, the solution can be found in collective answers, structural changes of life provisioning systems that enable, and this is crucial, a good life for all within planetary boundaries. So, in other words, we need to change the myth of the green consumer that leaves big polluting companies untouched into the urgent responsibility of future-proof politics to change the system, fueled by critical civil society. Now, having said this, I'm very happy to give the floor to Julia Steinberg, who, uh, yeah, was co-author of what I would call an article, scientific article with a remarkable title, Scientists that war, Warn on Affluence. So this really, uh, I found very interesting and this is a good uh, yeah, topic to give now you the floor, Julia. So thanks so much, Jake, and thanks for, um, for having me in, in Brussels. Uh, it's nice to be here with you. And I'm going to try to, to share my screen. I, uh, and while I'm doing that, which will might take me a little um, while, uh, is what I'd like to do is just state that the, the, um, this, uh, the scientist warning on affluence was uh, first author, the first author is Tommy Viedman. And I'm not even the, the um, uh, second, third, I think I'm the fourth author on there. So uh, I really enjoyed participating in that article, but for one thing I can't take credit for is the title. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, so but it w I, I really appreciated the work that went into it and I'm very proud to have been able to contribute. So I want to tell you, I mean, I really, this is just to get the discussion going. It's sort of the things I think about and you might think about them differently. So I want to tell you a bit about this idea of living well within limits because we sort of have to ask ourselves, what does it mean? What does living well mean even? Uh, talking about modeling decent living energy. So can we take the ideas that we have for living well within limits and transform them into an energy model for the future? And because we try to do this. And then talking about, a bit more about criticizing consumption and why this really goes to the heart of problems within our societies and what we can do about it. So um, the first point is living well within limits. <laughs> what does it mean? And the first thing you have to do is you have to think about well-being. And um, this is difficult for me because I, I have, you have to understand I'm trained as a physicist. I don't do physics anymore, but my original training was in physics. And let me tell you that when they train you in physics, they do not train you to think about your well-being, um, possibly quite the contrary. So I had to sort of learn about it and learn that there were different perspectives. And the only thing I'm going to be presenting here is not all the perspectives that exist, 
It's the perspective that I chose to use in my research. And this perspective is based on the theory of human needs by Ian um, Guff and Len Doyle. And the idea is that you really see well-being as kind of a pyramid. And um, I'll explain a bit why we see that, why we look at it like that later. But the idea is that you start from a basis of universal need satisfiers. So the things included in the, in the blue rectangle are non-negotiable. If anybody anywhere in the world at any time in history did not have their society's equivalent of that uh, need satisfier, um, they would be in deprivation. They would be harmed in their human potential to do whatever it was they wanted to do or that they needed to do. And so the idea here is that how these things are translated in time and space and technology and social institutions can change and should change but those things are non-negotiable. And once you have those, you can have achieve things like mental health, physical health, autonomy is very important, cognitive understanding and opportunities to participate. And the cognitive understanding, opportunities to participate on autonomy are very important because we need to be able not just to benefit from our societies, but to change our societies. And to change our societies, we need these elements that allow us to sort of loop back and change and improve things, hopefully. And at the top, you get this idea of well-being and social participation. And the reason I think it's important for it that we have this sort of idea that the well-being is positioned on top of these aspects is because it's, um, it's important to understand from our perspective, where if you take on this, this theory, that well-being depends on these constitutive elements. And if any, even just one of them is missing, it's not because you have more food that you can take, that you can compensate for a lack of housing. These things are not substitutable. We need a sufficient amount of each one, but maybe we don't need more than a sufficient amount of each one. So the other thing that's very interesting about these need satisfiers is that there's idea that at some point you have enough, you, your need is satisfied and you don't need to consume more because that need is already satisfied. Um, now, that's a nice theory you might say, but what about the reality? And uh, I'll just explain what this plot is showing. So I'll sort of walk through it a bit slowly, uh, these two plots. So this was uh, some work we did uh, that was published in 2018. And what we did is we had a data set of about 109 uh, international countries around the world. And we looked at how much needs, needs they satisfied. So from that list I showed you before, um, I sh we basically measure, had some threshold and we decided above this threshold, this need is satisfied, below it's not. And then we put countries based on how much need they satisfied, how many of these need basic needs they satisfied. We considered, we looked for instance at their average life satisfaction. And you can see that there's this very strong relationship. So indeed, the more of these basic needs you satisfy, the higher life satisfaction is, which is basically when you go around and ask people, how satisfied are you with your life? So it's a very all-encompassing um, indicator of well-being. And the same thing, uh, or even more strongly, for healthy life expectancy, which is the second plot, the one on the, on the right, where you can see that healthy life expectancy increases even more drastically and even saturates after you achieve a certain number of needs. So what we would say is actually the reality fits our, um, our conception about what are the constituent elements of well-being very well. We need a certain finite number of non-substitutable but satiable need satisfiers. So let's, and um, what we decided to do is we decided to study this, to use this to study how much stuff we need, how many resources we need, physical resources, um, within, our, within our societies. Uh, in order to be well. And so we have this basic idea where you go from sort of the biophysical inputs, energy, material, land, and so on, to the social outcomes uh, on the right. And between the two, you have these provisioning systems. And the provisioning systems are basically infrastructure and technology, but also social elements, states, markets, and so on. And so basically we see these provisioning systems as mediating between the biophysical inputs and the social outcomes. So the second point I wanted to discuss is, well, okay, can we use these ideas to study whether or not we can live well within planetary boundaries? Because right now, this is not happening. So because it's not happening right now, we have to imagine and model a different future. 
So what we did here is we used the ideas of uh, Professor Narasimha Rao of Yale University, who's been doing a lot of work on decent living energy um, in different uh, emerging and developing countries. And he wrote a fantastic paper, well, many fantastic papers, but uh, in particular, you might want to look at his paper on India, Brazil, and South Africa. Um, but in basically this theory links in a very pragmatic way, this idea of human need satisfaction and a minimum level minimum levels of core energy services. So basically saying, given our societies, given our technologies, this is the minimum that people need in order to be able to have a chance at life, to live life with dignity, without deprivation. And what we did in our global model is we took these ideas and we just took into account technological improvements. So huge, we're basically saying existing technologies on energy efficiency, but we're giving them to everybody. We're making them available to everybody around the world. Uh, we're saying everybody has an equal right to humans need satisfaction. So this is a model without overconsumption, but also without underconsumption. And uh, our aim is to understand degrowth, which is the, ch the reduction in energy demand. And this is sort of what our model looks like. Um, it's just to tell you that it involves these ideas of decent living standards, which you can see on the left. And then we translate those into personal consumption. Uh, public consumption in terms of schools and hospitals or things outside the home, uh, infrastructure around transport networks, buildings, et cetera, and also private consumption, which is, you know, the, the production sector. So we, we basically have both direct energy use and embodied energy use uh, in, our, in our system model. And we also take into account um, things like climate change around the world, but also climate change in the future, that there's going to be warming and hence more demand for cooling. Uh, we also take into account uh, population growth and demographic change. And these are our results and they're quite striking. So if you just look at the plot on the left, and I'm sorry, it's lots of plots if you're not used to seeing them, but I quite like them. So you're stuck with me. Um, so these are the results from our, from our global decent living model. And if you look at the plot on the left, you can see global final energy use as it's been in the past, that's the black line and as it's projected to continue by the International Energy Agency. Now, the International Energy Agency's reference scenario continues at the growth in energy demand. Then the International Energy Agency also has a two degree scenario, that's the orange line, where you sort of see it growing and then flattening off after 2030 or so. And um, the be below two degree scenario is the yellow line, and that sort of goes down a tiny bit. It basically stabilizes where it is now. Now, there was another low energy demand scenario, which is Arnold Krubler's, that already showed that we could uh, be okay at 250 um, exajoules uh, globally, but our decent living energy model goes down even further than that. It brings us down to around 150 exajoules. So basically what we're saying is providing decent living, well-being, sufficient for well-being circumstances for all does not have to cost uh, the earth in terms of energy use. We can actually, um, have sufficient energy for human universal need, human need satisfaction at 40% of our current consumption, despite population growth. And I think that that's, um, I'm hoping that that gives people a different sense of what's necessary to, to change things. It's about equality. It's about a high tech future where we're really def using uh, as much um, efficient technology as possible. And it's also about changing the ways we consume from private to public consumption. So now why is criticizing consumption so difficult, which is sort of the topic of what we're trying to do today. So here we basically have this idea that, you know, uh, this comes from Donut Economics from Kate Rayworth, if you know her. Um, uh, we're in the middle of this, the green donut. We have this idea of poverty and need. We're socially unsustainable. Somewhere in the, in the middle of this green donut, we, we have enough. And um, on the outside, we're in overconsumption and this is unsustainable. Um, so what we decided to do is we decided to look at um, how things were distributed between underconsumption and overconsumption. So we also have some, um, we decided to look within consumption categories as to how distribution happened. And uh, this was our paper uh, published in Nature Energy. We were very happy. And this is how the, the BBC decided to write about it. The rich are to blame, international, the rich are to blame for climate change, international study finds. Um, and uh, just to show you some of the things we found from our study, and again, this is, you know, more plots, but 
um, basically here what we see is we see uh, the distribution, the unequal distribution where you have 100% of the population versus 100% of the energy use. And the more the curve is pulled down on the plot, the further down the curve goes, the more highly unequal the energy consumption is. And one of the things that's very interesting is that you see that the most unequal consumption types of energy are around transportation. So package holidays, which involve lots of flying, uh, vehicle fuel, uh, other transport. And um, so you can really see that transport is extremely energy intensive and extremely unequally distributed far more than residential energy um, uh, or food related energy, for instance. And um, these, re these results are also reflected in uh, the UN emissions gap report, which I really recommend that you all go and look at, which came out this week. And they used um, um, another, uh, other studies and also relied on our studies uh, to, to talk about inequality. So if you look at chapter six, it really talks about this inequality in consumption. So where they show, you know, how much emissions the top 1% income earner has, uh, which is huge. It's around 74 tons per capita. The top 10% are even lower than that, but still extremely high above 20 tons per carbon. And then the middle 40% are, you know, maybe a factor of four down, the bottom 50% even further down. And um, where we should aim to be is actually much closer to the middle and bottom um, level than the top. So we really have to ask the question of overconsumption. And I think that that's, uh, you know, and you have this shocking statistic that the one top 1% 1 are responsible for 15% of emissions and the top 10% are responsible for almost half of all emissions worldwide. And so this is, the, so basically one of the things we see is that dealing with climate change and dealing with our planetary problems means dealing with consumption and especially the consumption of the wealthiest over consumption. So this is where uh, our, our article on scientists warning on affluence came in. Um, and uh, as, as Dirk was saying in his introduction, overconsumption is designed by states, industries, and markets. So we're not in a system where overconsumption is optional. It's actually um, part of the purpose of our economies and markets. So we need an outlet for growth. We need an outlet for productivity. And that leads to a lack of low consumption alternatives. And it leads to huge amounts of advertising for terrible things like large cars and so on. A lot of people driving the large cars do not realize that they're driving over uh, the futures of their children effectively. Um, there's also positional consumption. So the affluent drive consumption norms and, and uh, aspirations. So in our societies, we're told to look up to the most affluent and to try to imitate them and live like them. We've, we're sort of told that they're um, um, examples that we should aspire to. And also, um, simply being alive and working and trying to, to survive in unequal neoliberal economies, such as we all do, basically compels overconsumption. So, you know, if you have kids, if you have a job, if you have people you need to care for, you basically need a car because you can't, you can't do the things that are required of you otherwise. We need time-saving appliances. We need to sort of uh, high levels of connectivity and mobility. And, and, um, and uh, so it, it becomes very uh, difficult to live in a different way because of the, also just the constraints on us in, in the types of economies that we live in. And uh, I don't expect you to be able to read this table, but you can go and have a look at this article uh, because I do think it's actually really interesting to read. Uh, it's not very long, but we basically categorized approaches for trying to act on sustainability. So, and we categorized them as eco-socialism, eco-anarchism, and then more reformist approaches around uh, agrowth and uh, um, or the precautionary uh, principle and then green growth. And we sort of went through what are the core references, um, what are what are the principles? What are the goals? And I think that this gives you a sense. It gives a really nice map of what the different worldviews and what the different options of those worldviews are in order of what we could do. So um, uh, my conclusions here uh, very important to engage not only with how to resolve climate change, but also to understand why so little is being done. So yes, there are solutions. Yes, things can can be done differently, but we also have to understand why there's blockage. And uh, it's only by exposing the lock-ins around production consumption, uh, the inequality, the inequalities in power and uh, perspectives from political economy, for instance, political power and economic power coming together. It's only when we understand those that we understand who we need to fight 
to have a chance of success. That's my uh, very strong um, conclusion. And uh, we need more economics, meet economics of all stripes, which is my area now, but also more civil society to become involved. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Okay, Julia, thank you very much. It was a, a, lot, of, a lot of very relevant uh, graphs and, and, and data and, and analysis in a short time. Uh, and yes, I can only invite people who maybe it was a bit uh, in a lot just to read your articles because they are really worth uh, yeah, considering with more time. So I'm now happy to give the floor to uh, Jaap Tielbeke, as I said, uh, a Dutch uh, environmental journalist writing for the magazine The Groene Amsterdam, and he recently wrote a book, The Myth of the Green Consumer. So Jaap, I'm happy to give the floor to you. Yeah, thank you, Derek, and thank you, Julia, for this wonderful presentation. I don't have uh, a nice PowerPoint slideshow, so you'll have to uh, look at my face for the next 50 minutes. I can show you the book I wrote, which in Dutch is actually called Een beter milieu begint niet bij jezelf, uh, which literally translates as uh, a better environment doesn't start with yourself. And this was the slogan, this famous slogan, um, this is a negation of this famous slogan of the public service announcement, this campaign launched by the Dutch governments in the early 90s when I was growing up um, that basically showed you all these clips on the televisions telling people to uh, recycle their trash and to turn off the lights when you leave uh, your house and to uh, take shorter showers. And I really took that to heart as a child. I was very uh, environmentally concerned and I was really um, convinced by this idea that a better environment starts with your own, but with changing your own behavior. So um, I, I did that myself and I told all the people around me, you shouldn't be driving cars, don't you know how polluting that is? Um, but here we are, uh, 30 um, years later, and uh, or a little bit less, but uh, 25 years later, and um, we can, I don't have to tell you that the environmental crisis has in fact uh, grown and continues to grow still. Um, now I've been writing about the environmental crisis, uh, climate change for about five, six years now as a journalist, as Dirk mentioned. And my general question that I tried to explore was this, like how come we know we're heading towards this abyss and we have known for a couple of decades now, and yet we don't seem to be able to uh, change course. And um, in the book, I try to identify a couple of myths that I think are holding us back. Uh, and I will go a bit deeper into each of these myths. I also explore the question, okay, how can we, um, like Julia said, how can we achieve this more uh, systematic change? But maybe we can, um, save that part also for the panel discussion. So I'll go a bit more into these four myths that I identify in the first part of the book. And what they have in common is they basically, um, they basically refuse to acknowledge that something more fundamental has to change. Now, the first myth I uh, discuss is uh, the myth that we are all equally guilty that humankind is to blame. Now, in my book, I also use this concept of the Anthropocene, right, which has become very popular. And it's a useful concept, I believe, because it really grasps the enormity of the change we're actually experiencing right now, a change that is but much more than uh, climate change. It's also about sixth mass extinction, endangering all life on this planet. And it really shows that this is, like a, we're entering a new geological era. But I also believe there's a, this pitfall when we talk about the Anthropocene, because um, it's named after Anthropos, uh, the human, humankind. Um, and it seems to imply that we are all equally guilty. And, and this is something you hear a lot when we talk about climate change, uh, that we're all 
in this together. We have caused this and now we as a species have to find a solution. Now, this is obviously uh, quite misleading. Uh, you just have to look at the graphs that Julia just showed us to see why, um, because we know that the richest 10% are responsible for almost half of the global CO2 emissions. We know that poorer countries who contributed the least to this climate disruption are actually uh, the countries that are being the hardest hit right now, that are being, uh, that are most vulnerable to the consequences of this climate disruption. Um, so no, we are not all equally to blame and we are no, not all in this together um, and this ties into this second myth which is the myth of the green consumer and this is the message of this public service announcement of this uh, government campaign that we all have to contribute we all have to do our part and my main uh, problem with this is that it, it leaves out the structural causes they remain out of sight and more importantly it let the true polluters off the hook um, and it's no coincidence that this message that we all have to clean up after ourselves and we all have to contribute is actually a message that was actively promoted by these true polluters these big polluters um, we probably all know the example of bp when they try to um, rebrand themselves as Beyond Petroleum, the British oil company, um, they actively promoted this idea of a personal CO2 footprint. So uh, like the, the, the title of this webinar, they said we need to, you need to look in, in the mirror before you point your finger at us. And this is also something that Shell, uh, a message that Shell still sends when the CEO is asked, okay, what will you do or are you ready to take your responsibility? His general attitude is we just produce what the consumer asks of us. We're just fulfilling our tasks, um, supplying what people want. And if we want change, then we should start with the individual consumer. Now, in my book, I argue or I explain why uh, this is also completely misleading, because obviously the CEO of a company like Shell has a totally different position than the individual car driver, right? The individual car driver can uh, pay a bit extra at the gas station for Shell to plant some trees, another uh, green scheme I'll get into a bit, uh, a bit more later. And, or he can, if he or she has uh, the money, he can buy an electric vehicle. But there's something completely on a fundamentally different level than the position the CEO of Shell has. He can um, buy, he can change, actively change the infrastructure of our energy system by uh, reallocating investment funds, by cutting down on fossil fuel uh, uh, production and actively start investing in renewable energies. And I think there's an additional problem to this myth of the green consumer, uh, because instead of taking aim at these companies, we tend to blame each other. We're almost making uh, sustainability into this moral competition. I don't know what, what it's like in, in Belgium, but when we had the debate here in the Netherlands about the National Climate Accord, uh, there was a lot of this type of uh, rhetoric going around that uh, we, we seem to equate green living with this moral, um, uh, yeah, this moral idea of um, you can't, uh, are you, are you, you don't have um, solar panels on your roof, you basically can't uh, argue for stricter climate uh, regulations. So there's this message of hypocrisy. One of the best examples of that was when the students of the Fridays for the Future went to, um, to protest in The Hague, in the political capital of the Netherlands. And afterwards, there were these cynical people who said, yeah, but after their, um, after their protest, they went to the McDonald's to get a hamburger or they are 
still uh, every summer they're still going on holidays by uh, by airplane so they're hypocrites we shouldn't listen to this message and this is what you see time and time again like only climate purists can um, discuss this this climate crisis um, now there's another issue at stake here because and this ties into this idea of a just revolution because what we uh, associate with green behavior is often also a privilege not all of us can afford, right? Uh, for example, meat analogs are um, generally more expensive than these big kilo knallers, we call them in Dutch, these beads, big cheap bags of uh, beef. Um, traveling by train is usually more expensive than a cheap flight to another European uh, city and not everybody has the money to put solar panels on the roof or even have a, has a roof to put them on. So the green consumer cannot really deliver the structural change we need. Uh, have we, and, 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 and this is really something um, we should become more and more aware of. For example, when we talk about air travel, our tendency now is to cast blame on each other. This idea of flight shaming uh, when people go on holidays and travel by plane. Whereas I would argue that the people who should be ashamed of themselves are the politicians who continue to subsidize air travel, continues to push for uh, an extension of airports. Uh, so we really um, should change our perspective, I believe. And then the third myth is a bit more abstract, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, it's the myth of what I call the CO2 goggles, um, and which basically um, tries to address the ecological crisis by focusing on the symptoms. And the symptom, the most important symptom, is CO2. And they turn this into kind of an accountability issue, like something we can address with a more technocratic approach. Uh, our Dutch environment. Uh, Secretary for the Environment literally called it his task to uh, capture tons of CO2. So this tells you a lot about the mentality, like we need smart tweaks, we need smart managers who can deliver these CO2 reductions. But all too often, the kind of solutions we uh, invent while taking that approach don't lead to the desired outcomes. So I won't get into too much details, uh, but one of the primary examples is I believe this idea of carbon markets and in the European Union we have this idea of the uh, European uh, emission trading scheme which um, I, I don't want to get into detail but basically it, uh, it provides a smoke screen behind which politicians can hide and say let the markets handle this where in fact all the decisions about high, how high the cap is of such a trading scheme. If we give free emission rights to big polluters, these are all political decisions. But this idea of a carbon market obscures that fact. And then we have uh, the idea of carbon offsetting uh, programs that have similar um, problems. And they tend to see forests or oceans, they treat them as carbon sinks instead of part of an ecosystem. Um, and you see that companies like Shell, uh, they buy into this idea by um, basically saying, we can continue our current way of living by driving cars or by flying, as long as you pay a little bit extra, uh, by which we can uh, then plant some trees or protect some forests that will um, uh, that will then absorb CO2, so you can um, you can rest your conscience. You can uh, travel by plane or car without feeling bad about it. Now, in the most extreme um, ideas, that turns into solutions such as uh, carbon capture and storage, um, which is obviously uh, an option in the future, but people. Our politicians tend to rely on that for uh, a large part, especially we saw that in the Netherlands as well, uh, where they had this, um, they presented these plans and they said, okay, we'll just bury 
this part of CO2 emissions underground. So this, when you look through the CO2 goggles, you only tend to see the symptoms and not the underlying causes. Now, the final myth I want to uh, discuss is this idea of the myth of a techno fix. And in that chapter, I try to basically debunk the eco-modernist mindset um, and this idea that eventually technological innovation will save us, that green growth is the solution to all our problems. And I believe that this comes down to also a philosophical attitude, attitude and it's based on this ontological separation between humankind and nature and the idea that we should and uh, we could and should tame uh, the natural world and use it and exploit it for our benefits and in the most uh, extreme examples this leads to this idea of geoengineering uh, for example this idea is these plants for screens of aerosols or to create um, massive algae blooms that will then absorb um, CO2 emissions. And that pretty much, I believe, shows our hubris, uh, where in fact, the more and more we learn about nature and the living planet and ecosystems, um, the more ridiculous this idea seems that we can basically um, tame nature because uh, we are fundamentally connected to it. We are, and uh, this is something uh, that is beautif that beautifully described in this uh, biography of uh, Alexander von Humboldt. Uh, he talks about this idea of the web of life. Uh, and this is a fundamentally different worldview than the eco-modernist mindset. Now, uh, when it comes to green growth, I think we maybe we can uh, dive a bit deeper into that in the discussion with Julia, because she also showed that more and more research now clearly um, shows that this uh, has proven to be an illusion. Uh, the decoupling we need, whether it's uh, in uh, material research use or um, uh, CO2 emissions, we can't uh, deliver that when we continue to grow our energy and resource demands. Um, so historically, it's very clear that the, the, the rule of thumb is the richer a country or a person is, the dirtier a country or a person is. Um, so these are basically the four myths. And like I said, they all, the underlying um, idea that ties them together is that they don't acknowledge that something fundamentally, something systematic has to change. Now, uh, I do believe that something is changing and when Shell posted uh, a Twitter poll recently and they asked people what they are willing to change to help reduce emissions I don't know if you saw that message but it backfired spectacularly uh, and Greta Thunberg um, she wrote back well I am willing to and I, I quote now uh, willing to call out the fossil fuel companies for knowingly destroying the future living conditions for countless generations for profit and then trying to distract people and prevent real systematic change through endless greenwashing campaigns. So the younger generations is no longer having it anymore. They don't buy this green PR and that's something I find uh, very uh, hopeful because when I was a child and when I was confronted with these campaigns, I really internalized the blame. Like I believed that as long as I still took long showers or didn't recycle my trash or didn't turn off the lights when I uh, left home, that I was to blame and I was responsible for the growing ecological uh, disaster. And nowadays, these kids uh, are taking a totally different attitude. They're saying to politicians, to the people in the boardrooms, how dare you? You are ruining our future. And they're suing polluting companies. They're suing the politicians who enable these companies. And they're holding those responsible who are indeed responsible. So that is something that really uh, gives me hope. And maybe we can go into that a bit deeper uh, during the panel discussion. Thank you. 
Okay, many thanks for, uh, I think, uh, Secretary, uh, thoughtful and inspiring um, contribution. I already see so many questions and dialogue in the chat, so that's really very uh, positive. So I would really uh, think we should go to uh, questions people already put in the chat. Um, I think one very interesting thing is that, uh, and yeah, Julia was already answering the questions in the chat, but I think it's good to, to uh, go deeper into them. It's about uh, if we uh, yeah, have a redistribution of the wealth in a more equal way, isn't then, it's, it sounds obvious that then more poor people get more income and will consume more, so the average consumption level will uh, yeah, increase. So uh, yeah, Julia, maybe you can... Uh, Explain a little bit the answer you already wrote in the chat. Sure. So um, the, the redistribution question is really is really interesting because um, it's 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 again I think uh, and I, I really appreciated Yap's presentation it was really um, masterful because it basically is a really nice um, overall description of the kinds of traps uh, you know wherever you look you can't that there's no way out. You always, you're never perfect enough. You're never doing enough. You know, it doesn't matter if rich people, you know, it doesn't, whatever we do, it doesn't matter. Whatever we do, it's not enough. And then, and, and you get lost in these traps and one of them, and there, there are actually a lot of these are traps, uh, as you said, that are basically designed by the fossil fuel industry because they've been, they knew about the problems of climate change for so long that they had a lot of time to think of ways to counter what we would want to do about it. And one of the one of the one of these traps is, in fact, the, um, this idea that oh, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter if we, the rich, you know, the globally rich or um, or the wealthiest around the world, stop consuming as much, because um, uh, the poorest will want to consume so much more anyway that you know it's it's just all going to be a disaster and there's no point. And um, and this idea that, um, you know, and it, it's also a very uh, regressive way of seeing the world because it basically means nobody should have as much opportunities as we had, that we were the last generation to think that we could have these opportunities and we can't afford to give them to anybody else because, you know, the, we've polluted the environmental commons too much to allow them to develop. And, uh, and um, one, of my, one of my really good friends, Chanali Pachari, she's, she's from India, and she got really angry with this at some point. And she actually did a back of the envelope calculation. And she was like, okay, you know what? Let's assume coal-fired power stations in India, and let's just give everybody electricity access anyway, and a certain level of electricity access consist. I mean, that's what she works on. She works on energy access for, for, for poverty alleviation. And uh, it turned out that it was less emissions to give electric uh, sufficient electricity to every single last man, woman, and child in India, as it was. It's the same emissions as just the American fleet of car getting more polluting year on year. Not the American, not the total fleet, not the total American cars. Just because every year they drive worse cars because they drive heavier and heavier cars, as we do in Europe as well, actually. And it was just such a, you know, so you really see that overconsumption and energy access are really quite on the same level. And so what Yannick Oswald, who's um, a brilliant uh, PhD student in my group, and he did this study on inequality. And what he did is he did it, the next study he's done, and I can't share it with you yet because it's not published, um, or I can share it with you as long as you promise not to send it to anybody else, and, but I can only do that through email. Um, he basically took world income um, and he, as distributed within countries and across countries, and the different types of energy use, not just energy use overall, but because the people, different people with different incomes spend on different categories, and he knows the energy intensity of all those categories, and he ran these models of what, what does redistribution look like, and providing enough energy for any, everybody, basically, you know, squeezing basically people down to some kind of middle would only increase um, energy consumption by a few percent. I think it was something like 6%. So it's not, you know, there's this idea that people uh, who need more energy are going to be have very, very energy intensive requirements, but actually it balances out with overconsumption. And so we really can, I think we really need to ask the two questions together. Um, so that would be my, my way of seeing it. So if I may, uh, resume that the good news is actually that we can afford to give everybody decent 
uh, access to electricity levels if we just uh, decrease our affluence. If we get rid of our SUVs, we will. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Just ask uh, Julia uh, a question because I think when when um, you talk about the redistribution question, there's perhaps another thing to take into account. Like I recently uh, read this new book by uh, Jason Hickel. Uh, I'm sure some of you might know it. Less is more, and what he describes and what I found very insightful is the difference between uh, private consumption and public consumption. So when you deal with redistribution and uh, taxing uh, the wealthy. You can also use that money um, to uh, provide for public services, which provide, you know, a better quality of living. This idea of the good life, uh, Derek, that you mentioned, um, but it's also much more ecologically uh, friendly. So, so I always give the example like. When you talk about policy decisions, do we choose to invest in um, infrastructure for electric vehicles or do we invest that money into public transport? Now, obviously, the second option is a lot more sustainable and a lot more uh, equitable, I would say. So um, I don't know if there's this, uh, if, if that's also something you, you study, Julia. Yeah, and um... I really agree with that. And I think it's also something that um, George Monbiot, uh, so Jason Hickel's book, Less is More, is so fantastic. And I really recommend it to, to everybody. If you're thinking of Christmas presents for yourself or anybody else, if you've already have Yap's book, the first book, the first book, then then you can get shake or both, both. They can wear yeah. Sorry for interrupting, but we are at this very moment translating the book of Jason Hickel into Dutch. Okay. So for people who want to read it in English, please buy it now. But other people who yeah. want to in uh, and he will come if Corona and all stuff allows. He will come in spring to Belgium to present his, his the Dutch translation of his book. So uh, that's fantastic. Um, so 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 yeah. So Jason Hickel talks about this, and um, another person who's been talking about this is George Mombio, and he is. I think he's even writing a book about. Everybody's writing a book um, uh, uh, about this now. But the, this idea of private frugality, so private sufficiency and public luxury, that one of the things we need, that a sustainable society, the society of the future, everybody should have enough for their own personal, you know, well-being and comfort in their home, but that doesn't have to be too much. Um, so we need to avoid overconsumption. And then there's this idea of public luxury, which is really great publicly shared infrastructure. And that's health infrastructure, education, culture, leisure, all the things we want to do for each other and sort of spend time together you know, when Corona, when Corona is over, but even during Corona times, you saw how important it was to have open public spaces, you know, where you could just go for a walk, socially distanced walk with somebody in order not to, not to catch Corona, to go to the park for a walk, you know, just to get out, um, out, out of it. So, so this idea of public luxury is very, uh, is very central. In the Decent Living um, Energy paper, so the paper where we modeled um, uh, Decent Living, uh, conditions for everybody at a minimal level of energy, we try to include these public infrastructures through health, education, so everybody has access to health, everybody has access to education, and also put through public transit. So these are absolutely central ideas. And one of the things we need to think about is moving away from our, moving our revenue and our economic activities away from private expenditure and towards shared invested expenditure. Um, so, and, you know, and, bring, and bringing that into democratic control as well. So we don't, you know, want it to be planned or centrally decided or anything like that, but we want, we want to have some control over it, but we can do that through mechanisms of economic democracy. So I think that that's, that's really interesting. There is another question. Uh, I think this really connects to this democracy topic. Uh, Steve writes, justice and equity equity often seems to be stated as taken for granted necessities for addressing climate change and the ecological emergency, but a lot of powerful actors and perhaps publics don't want justice and equity. So any thoughts on this, he asks. <laughs> Big question, but I think very relevant these days. So. Um... Hi, Steve. <laughs> Why don't you answer it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the funniest answer. 
I have heard. <laughs> Um, I think I think Steve is well placed to know more about this than other people. But uh, yeah, we're open. If Steve wants to take the floor, he can do it. Huh? It's interactive. I'll comment very briefly. I only um, it's just in the context, for instance, of UK politics. I get a sense that I suppose it's the left wing, right wing aspect that a lot of environmentalism often seems to be um, portrayed as a left wing um, issue, and clearly some ideas of justice and equity play into that so no i don't have any answers um so, yeah. <laughs> sorry can i can i maybe give a bit of a hopeful uh, perspective from the dutch context now i don't want to um don't want to imply that we're uh we're heading towards the right direction uh, here in the netherlands at all because we're uh, down on the European lists of uh, CO2 reduction and energy, uh, renewable energy were uh, at the bottom. But one of the remarkable things uh, last year when you saw the debate about um, the climate policy and sustainability policy uh, really taken into the mainstream and we had to come into this, uh, we had to get to this climate agreement, you saw also um, parties that are traditionally more right wing uh, really um, acknowledge this idea of a just transition, that we should have uh, a fair sharing of the cost, that we should be careful that the poorest people don't carry uh, the largest burden. Now, often the danger is, because you saw that happening after the uh, Gilets Jaune movement in France, after the Yellow Vest uh, uh, protest, where a lot of people were, um, you know, took that as a lesson uh, that they tried to say, okay, we should prevent that from happening. Now, there were basically two responses. Most left-wing parties said, uh, okay, we should, the lesson is that we should, um, um, combine uh, justice with this ecological transition. But you also saw uh, that acknowledgement from right-wing parties, but they had also had the tendency of saying, okay, we shouldn't be too ambitious when it comes to climate policies. We shouldn't be, uh, we shouldn't set too uh, high uh, goals or, or, or we should take it slow. And obviously that is a ridiculous answer, but it did, uh, as a consequence, this idea of uh, just transition, we also had this climate march where this was the central uh, topic, is, I believe, moving into the mainstream. So it's no longer a discussion uh, that is taking place on the left side of the political spectrum. Okay, thanks. Maybe I think also quite interesting because here we now have a quite international public at this webinar. You, yeah, if you could speak a little bit about the court case against Shell, which I think is, is, is quite uh, interesting. Yes, yeah, in the Netherlands, we're really um, at the forefront of, um, of, of uh, legal mobilization uh, in terms of when it comes to climate change. We had obviously the agenda case against the Dutch government. Uh, which was a historical win for the climate movement that basically uh, said that the Dutch government needs to do more um, to reduce emissions um, because otherwise it would violate human rights. Um, and now the same lawyer for a different uh, environmental organization, Milieu Defensie in the Netherlands, is um, suing Shell. And this is, I think, taking it even a step further. I mean, the, the, the win in the Urgenda case was already quite remarkable, quite unexpected also by a lot of legal uh, scholars. Um, and it really is an example for a lot of similar court cases around the world. Uh, you have the same one in, in, in Belgium, the Klimaatzaak. And I think there's a couple of ones. Uh, there's in the UK, you also have, you had a similar court case against the extension of Heathrow. Um, and right now you see uh, another step. Uh, so court cases against um, fossil fuel companies, and you have uh, quite a, a few different ones in the United States. You also have court cases against uh, uh, fossil fuel companies uh, that are about uh, damages. So they have to pay for 
um, they have to contribute to climate adaptations because, or they're being sued that they have to pay for climate adaptation because they're the ones that caused it. But in the Netherlands, there's now this court case where an environmental NGO tries to um, force Shell to change course. So to bring their own um, investment policies in line with the Paris Accord. Now, I don't know if uh, they have any chance of winning but like I said, when, with the Urgenda case, um, there were also a lot of people who, who thought, a lot of experts who thought uh, they had no chance of winning and eventually they did. And even, let me just say this as a final note, even if they don't win, um, they really, um, they, they, they supercharge a very important debate because they ask the relevant question, who is to blame for uh, climate change, who is to blame for this environmental crisis? And they're taking this issue to the courts where an objective judge uh, can rule, but it's also in constant uh, dynamic with obviously the debate, the larger debate in a society. So I think court cases like this, uh, they have a double effect. No lawyer will say, okay, if I win this court case, then we've solved the problem. But they, uh, I think they are important um, contribution to uh, yeah this larger debate. Okay. Um, and maybe I should just say something because Steve did ask that question and I, I was a bit unfair in, in, in sending it back to him. Um, I think that I think that there's a lot of fear around inequality, so around changing inequality and around equity. And again, this has to do with narratives that are very often uh, put forward by people in powers. And one of the things that Jason Moore, uh, Jason Moore, there's too many good Jasons here, but Jason Hickel um, uh, talks about in his book, Less is More, is he talks about uh, these examples in the past where people did have fairly equitable societies over long, you know, in some cases over long durations that functioned fine, but that then were undermined by people in power. But one of the things, one of the myths that's out there that is put forward by people in positions of wealth and power is there's not enough to go around and you will suffer if there's more equality. So that they really sort of try to present the move towards equality as detrimental for the, for, for the average welfare or for the welfare of at least the people that they want to support them uh, uh, in voting, for instance, um, or that they want to support their policies. So they really try to present, present um, more equity as a scare tactic, that equity is something that brings people down. And the thing is, anytime we look for evidence for this, we find that equity lifts people up, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that a, an equitable, I mean, and you can see it with coronavirus or any public health issue, name any public health issue, it will always be made better by having a more equitable, um, uh, freely available, um, for, you know, access to everybody, healthcare system, like, healthcare, like we have best health when everybody around us has good health, you know? So, and you, you can start there and you can keep going with education, you can keep going with, with, with everything there is. So I think that this is something that we really need to, to fight very strongly is this, uh, this, this core idea that inequality is going to result in negative, out, that equality is going to result in negative outcomes. Uh, because um, so many powerful people have a vested interest in inequality that they really want to keep it uh, to maintain it, and the way they maintain it is they, um, whoops, sorry about that, um, they, uh, um, that they make it impossible to try to move towards equity by basically making it a scare story. Okay, thanks. Maybe it was something put in the chat quite early, but I think it relates to our discussion now. It's about the energy uh, level in a decent living perspective, which is uh, quite low. So it's, it's only reachable if we invest in uh, low energy houses and so on. So maybe it's something, Julia, you can uh, explain a little bit. So what the, what the energy level c uh, consists of? Well, if you take an average uh, energy level, in yeah. the level scenario, it's much lower than the yeah, yeah. effluent societies we use every day. Yeah. So what it corresponds to in terms of, um, uh, it corresponds to in terms of levels, I had a, I had a slide on this that would, be, uh, that would be easier to share, but it's gonna take too long to try to find it. So it corresponds to an equitable amount. Um, basically there's a minimum amount of energy services delivered. 
so the way we think about it is in terms of energy services, which are not measured in terms of energy, which makes it a bit um, at the same time more easy to understand and more complicated to compare. So like a uh, heated surface area, so like um, a comfortable indoor space of a certain size that everybody has access to. And that, so it's, um, it's on average, it's not very big, it's on average 15 square meters per person, um, uh, kept at 20 degrees no matter what the season is all over the world. So incredible, lots of heating or lots of cooling depending on where you are in the world. So that's one of them. Uh, in terms of mobility, we have a certain number of passenger kilometers, um, a few thousand, uh, it's actually quite large uh, per year. Um, so, so we have these certain levels and the point is that we're using very efficient technology to translate those into energy terms. So the average is around 15 gigajoules per capita, including all the upstream energy and all the energy to construct the vehicles and the housing and all of that. So it includes all the, the, the embedded energy in it. And that's quite hard to compare with what we use now because, you know, in affluent societies we'll use um, easily, easily several times that, you know, um, you know, in the, in the worst cases up to 10 times that. And, uh, but it, it's just that the two things are hard to compare because we're also, not only are we using more for more, but we're also using more very inefficiently. So, so that's the, that's the issue. But I think that the, it's interesting to think about it from this energy services perspective, because it really sort of tells you what you're getting for it, as opposed to what, uh, you know, just because you could use the same amount of energy, but just by going out and spending all your income on petrol and going into your backyard and burning it. But maybe that's not so interesting for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, people saying yes. Uh, our role as consumer, shouldn't we do all our best? Uh, but maybe we can ask Ja, because he writes his book, uh, that, uh, well, we are not only consumer, we are also citizens. And so uh, there are some, I think, uh, things to, uh, yeah, to invest in relevant action. Right, yeah, uh, there's a common misconception and that has partly to do with my book title in uh, Dutch uh, that what I'm trying to say is that we can just lean back and wait for the politicians and big companies to handle it. Now, this is obviously not what I argue uh, in the book. And um, regarding the question, shouldn't we do our best as consumers? Right. I'm, I'm all for that, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, I think everybody should um, make the decisions in his own lifestyle that he or she feels uh, comfortable with. But we shouldn't have the illusion that that in itself will and can change the world. Now, I know that sounds a bit, um, that sounds like a crazy assumption, but I think for a long time, we actually, um, this was the narrative that was pushed. If we uh, start with our own behavior, we can um, help shift markets, right? Uh, and this was also a message that was actively promoted by uh, politicians because um, the idea was that we have these self-regulating markets. The, the governments don't have to act as you know police officers or don't have to set stricter regulations because the demand from the market will eventually shift um, shift in towards a more sustainable style of consumption. Now, this is obviously not something that has happened and it's not something that is happening. A, a, a clear example of that that I always use is meat consumption in the Netherlands. Now, it is, uh, you have these surveys and I think over half of the Dutch people say they have uh, stopped eating meat or uh, are eating less meat than a couple of years before so and and you can see there's a, a a normative shift in society right 10 years ago when you were vegetarian you came to a birthday party people say oh okay let me see if i can find some bread for you uh and and and, and when you went to a restaurant there were hardly any vegetarian options now when you walk into a supermarket there's plenty of meat analogs there's plenty of vegetarian options on restaurant menus so there's clearly a shift going on there but when you look at the numbers of meat consumption they're not going down right and maybe the trend will change uh, this year with with corona we don't know exactly why these uh, trends uh, don't uh, get any lower uh, but one of the explanations is most likely that people overestimate their own um, uh, sustainable 
behavior. So this is, I think, a very uh, clear example that shows why only acting as consumers will not do the job. Now, like you said, I argue in the book that we should take action into our hands as citizens, which means pressuring those people in power who can make a systemic change. And uh, that means getting involved politically, uh, which starts with voting uh, every four years uh, or in local elections and European elections as well, obviously. It can also mean um, getting involved in a political party and trying to uh, get a more uh, robust climate section in, in, in the party program. It can mean becoming active on uh, a, a local level or even in your own neighborhoods. Um, it can mean taken to the streets when climate marches or, or becoming involved in the climate movement. Uh, you have all these different ways of exerting pressure of the people in power. And one of the ways we just also discussed is also by legal uh, mobilization, but that's one of the many options. Now, I don't have a list in the book uh, of like 10 things you can or should do uh, to save the planet. I think that is something uh, we all have to figure out for ourselves what we feel comfortable with. I think uh, Julia, uh, uh, Julia's way is also to do research on this and to give presentations like these to involve people. So when people ask me, like, what do you do uh, to fight climate change? I don't say, okay, I stopped eating meat or I, uh, I, uh, I'm not flying anymore. I say, uh, no, I'm, I'm reading about it. I'm writing about it. I'm thinking about it. And I'm trying to, uh, spread awareness through uh, through what I write. And that is my role, I think, as a journalist and uh, uh, Julia's role as a scientist. So I think um, that's the way we should approach it. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe I think it would be also a good thing to connect this uh, conversation with uh, the actual uh, political uh, decisions being made. Uh, we all know that since a year, uh, the opinion introduced the Green Deal. Uh, we know that there is a climate law on the table and uh, this very night the leaders of the member states reach an agreement which is I so and, and of course my question is is this really a, a step forward ambitious or are we still uh, yeah too much thinking that uh, we're doing a lot but in reality it will not be sufficient so I would like to hear your opinion on uh, yeah European climate policies and things being uh, Green Deal from the Commission uh, debate in the European Parliament. So, I don't know, Julia, whether you are... Uh... Yeah, it, um, it's interesting because, so I think that there's a lot, there was a lot of excitement about the, the, the idea of a European Green, Green New Deal uh, or Green Deal and, um, and then, much more disappointed when it came when it comes to actually looking at, at what's on the table and it, it falls short. And I think the, the thing that's for me the most positive at this time is that um, well first of all that they felt that they felt that this was something I mean the thing is that they felt not only that it was important and I believe a lot of these politicians do believe that acting on climate is something important and urgent. I think that one of the things you have to understand about politicians is that it's a rare thing to have a politician who's also a leader. They're very often followers. They're very often people who sort of, you know, look out carefully to see which ways the wind are blowing before they take a position. Um, and what's interesting here is I think that these are people who thought it was important and who saw the wind blowing in such a direction that they thought that there was popular support for these ideas around a green deal. That people want jobs and they pe really, people want a uh, transformation, not just of a few things, but a transformation of the whole economy which is what this, what this represents, these ideas. And uh, they, there was ideas around justice, ideas around employment, uh, around industrial policy. So I think all of that is very positive that people, uh, that these politicians felt that they could, and Ursula von der Leyen felt that, you know, that this was something she could get behind and, and push forward and benefit from as well. So that's, some, that's positive. What's negative about it is of course that it's, it's really insufficient. There's still too many things like um, reliance on different kinds of offsets and, counting on negative emissions technologies and not enough of the equity aspect, I would argue, that we're not really targeting and understanding that over consumers are, that overconsumption has to stop. 
And, uh, and so, um, and I think that that's something where we really have to do more work and hopefully this is something that's already starting, you know, this year right now uh, with the UNEP emissions gap report, which is so very, very strong on, on inequality and really saying we cannot target, we cannot solve the climate problem without uh, dealing with overconsumption and Europe has more than its fair share of overconsumption going on. So I think that that's one thing that we really have to start, you know, we just have to start facing and really hammering that point home. Uh, I think the, the second thing that's very positive to me is that we have a new generation of uh, activists and advocates and uh, it's really encouraging to me to hear somebody like yep, just explain like, okay, I grew up with these ideas and they were all wrong and look at, I mean, the way he was, he's just able to put these ideas in his book and put these ideas together in terms of saying, you know, all of this stuff was a distraction and this is how we move forward. I mean, that's, that's, that's already, you know, a, a very, a very powerful thing to be able to do. And when the, when these, these popular movements and especially the youth climate movements are interacting with politicians now, they're not doing the things that, you know, the people of my generation were told like, oh, somebody gets into power now you need to shut up. Oh, they're already do, they already adopted the label of what you wanted to do. Now you need to shut up. Like nobody's shutting up. Nobody's going home. I mean, people are stuck at home because of Corona, but you best, people are still doing the activism, right? People are still trying to put the pressure on the, these politicians. And so the very idea that people are refusing to demobilize and to stop their credit being cr openly critical because politicians have adopted a certain slogan, I think that's really positive. And I'm seeing that in the US as well, where, you know, Joe Biden's doing some things right, and then everybody goes clap, 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 and he does some things wrong, and people are like, oh, no, you don't. No way. You know, and they're really very aggressively critical of him. And that's good because politicians respond very well to aggressive criticism, especially by their allies. And I think that that's a real lesson that we need to take with us is we need to keep that level of criticism up because yeah, it's not good yet, but that's our job. We need to make it good. And that's how we do it is we shout very loud. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, if you want to. Yeah, open. yeah, I think you, I think Julia points to something crucial and it also has to do with our perspective on what politics entails. It doesn't mean just getting someone in power, but it means also shifting the whole ideological uh, narrative. And that's what we're seeing happening now. And that's why I'm actually quite hopeful uh, when it comes to the Green Deal of the European Union, because I think it is in part inspired by this idea of the Green New Deal that was first promoted in 2008 uh, and recently uh, picked up by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in uh, the United States. And what is so powerful about it, it's uh, a couple of things. It's A, it has a very strong idea of the role of the government. It's no longer um, sitting back and not the market handling it. No, it's really going back to uh, the idea of FDR, of Roosevelt, uh, and saying um, the government is uh, stepping into the driver's seat and we are going to transform the whole economy. That's the second part of it. It's that it's much more holistic. It's not uh, looking at the problem through the CO2 goggles with technocratic, uh, merely technocratic solutions, but it's really uh, saying um, the biodiversity loss, climate change, it's all tied together. This requires uh, overhaul of the way we live, the way we travel, the way we eat, the way we produce uh, energy and the way we consume. And I think you see elements of this, um, this, this idea behind the, at least the original outset of the Green Deal, right? I uh, interviewed uh, the Dutch politician Frans Timmermans a couple of times, um, who is responsible on a European level for executing this Green Deal. And I do feel like he um, really understands and acknowledges this, um, yeah, this mindset behind it. And he embraces also the idea of the need for a just transition. Now, with the political execution in the European context, that's obviously uh, very difficult. And that is something we need to follow uh, critically because we recently saw also in the European Parliament that um, this making the European agricultural uh, system more sustainable is um, not happening at the moment. Like the most ambitious plan of, of greening, of the greening of the agricultural subsidy, uh, flow of subsidies, um, it didn't pass through the European Parliament and we're stuck in the same old model. Um, and you also saw activists pointing to that and saying we need to 
um, reevaluate this, we need to uh, push for uh, more ambitious climate targets when it comes to uh, agricultural policy. So, um, like, there's, I'm, I'm hopeful of the direction things are going in, but at the same time, we can say, okay, um, it's nowhere uh, near enough. Um, so we need to, to to keep following it critically and to keep pushing uh, for better regulations and better policy. Okay, thanks. I um, I think Alexis in the chat is adding a very important uh, new dimension. It's clear, I think, with Green New Deal and all, with Green European Green Deal and also the now the Corona crisis that the role of the state is obvious again and also the importance of public services to think about the health services, hospitals. Uh, but uh, Alexis writes in, in the chat, isn't it the core of political ecology that uh, individuals organizing community, it's about self-organization, it's about commons, it's not commodified ways of being a producer as citizen. So how do you see the potential role of commons in uh, yeah, a decent life scenario and, and an economy related to that. Are you asking anybody in particular? Or? You can start, yeah, please. Um, I wish I could get some more time to think about this uh, question uh, because it's obviously a very important question and it ties into this idea of political ecology which has a very decentralized bottom-up approach which seems to be at odds with the more uh, centralized idea of government uh, policies and, and, and the New Deal uh, approach which is much more top-down. Uh, I believe that also to reclaim the commons we need strong government interventions to protect these areas uh, from, uh, from market forces so to speak. I mean markets are always uh, formed by uh, government decisions. Uh, but you saw this very clearly with the energy transitions in Germany that uh, government policies can stimulate, um, for example, self-sufficient communities. They can, um, they can create, I don't know what the English word for it is, the draagvlak. Uh, Dirk, how would you translate it? Draagvlak, it's a very Dutch word. Uh, the support. support, public support, support yeah, I guess, public support for the energy transition by uh, allowing people to have ownership in the ways of energy production. So I think that is absolutely crucial. Now, I don't believe that that in itself is enough that we move to a world of self-sufficient uh, communities. I think we do need uh, top-down uh, centralized uh, governments to 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 uh, make this transition happen. We still would need some form of uh, centralized uh, energy production, uh, which we see happening now when it comes to um, wind parks at sea. So I don't know. But I'm, I'm also curious, Dirk, because I know you're more of a proponent of the decentralized uh, way. How, how you view this? Well. I'm the moderator, so I shouldn't be uh, talking too much. Maybe you should. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay. sure you have something to say about this. I think um, I see commons as uh, forms of prefiguration. Now, while the small experiments of how we can build uh, the new economy, um, and the answer, you, uh, the example you gave of the energy transition in Germany is, is very a very good one, because commons uh, the was not, uh, they were not successful because he fought against the state. No, it was a state that introduced a very uh, supportive energy law, which uh, was very basic. It guaranteed basic uh, feed-in tariffs. So communities in cities, but also in villages, they knew if we invest in renewable energy systems, it will be uh, a safe investment. And also on the local level, even in, in rural, areas, you had conservative mayors putting up uh, cooperatives, co-ops together with the citizens um, because they knew this is a kind of future and uh, it's very intriguing to see that they now are rich rural communities. 
in a way. So I do believe that comments are important, but they can only, and that was also one of the lessons of uh, Ushtrum, who studied them, they can only survive in a protective environment because they are always nested in an institutional system. Uh, for instance, if you look at the situation in Belgium, why did commons, land commons disappear? Well, it's very simple. 10 years after the state of Belgium uh, was established, there was a law voted in parliament that said there's only public or private property. That's it. So the, the legal framework of the modern society actually killed the commons. So if you, if you will want to build a, against space for commons, we have to change our legal uh, framework uh, in many, many ways. And a lot of people that are now establishing new commons like co-housing projects, they face huge legal problems because every part of legislation is uh, focused on people living in a single household. So I think uh, commons can play an important role, but to make it a success, we have to uh, change our laws. And I always say the last 30 neoliberal years, we have invested and believed that public private partnership is the answer. I think that uh, it's now time to invest in a public civil partnership. Citizens that are really willing to take uh, action and you see, uh, and governments have to uh, yeah, reinvent themselves and become a kind of partner state. And the good thing is that more and more on the local level, you see these things happening. Uh, Italy was one of the first uh, countries where a lot of cities are now supporting uh, the commons. Bologna was the first to introduce a kind of city constitution for the regulation and care of the commons. And now also other cities are doing it. So I think, yes, uh, um, it's a kind of area which is under uh, underdeveloped and also not is not being enough research in on this field. So this uh, is what I would say my short answer. Mm -hmm. And I see here writing and Chapman in chat in UK we have the cooperative and community benefit societies. Uh, also in Belgium we see a, a huge uh, increase in corps. Also, so here also, I don't want to take over the role as a moderator, but I'm curious because <laughs> uh, Julia, you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned this difference between eco anarchism and eco socialism. Mm -hmm. Does that have something to do with this debate of about the role of the, of of the government or? Um, so that's not at the front of my mind right now, but um, mm. there, there's a couple of things that are at the front of my mind. Just hearing hearing Dirk in this idea of the commons. Um, and I, I think one of the things I would just like to say here is that um, we, when we talk about the consumer, we're like, we've been taught to see ourselves as consumers. And one of the things I just want to remind people of is that the, role, the word consumer is actually a very negative word. <laughs> because it, it literally, in, in English, at least, or everywhere, it means the thing that devours and destroys. Like, it means, like, literally to consume is like to be consumed by flames, like, uh, tuberculosis used to be called consumption because it would waste away people. It was a wasting disease. So this idea of um, uh, th this idea of consumption is really an idea of destruction. And I think that one of the things that commons remind us of, uh, and that and why it's so important to engage in them, and why they're always so endangered, is because they actually are sort of a, a representative of an alternative form of society that exists throughout history, throughout different economic forms. But that's threatened tremendously by capitalism and, you know, modern legal systems and so on, which is a relational system, which is basically saying we're not consumer, we're not, we, our role is not just to take, but also to give back. And our role is to maintain and to take, to take care of. So care-based economies, relational economies, um, and, and this idea also that comes, you know, in most indigenous cultures against, you know, there's these cultural rules against overconsumption where you're not supposed, yes, of course you should take, you need to eat, you need to live, you need to do your things, but you shouldn't take more than your, your environment can deal with. And it's a relational thing. It's like, I take from you now, but I will give back to you later. And, and so I think one of the things that's really important with the commons is that they're, they're a kind of space where that relational economy or that care economy uh, really comes into being, like where you really sort of can uh, can live it and, it, and that's what we need to be to be turning towards. And because it's always under threat, I think one of the things we need to really bake into whatever we build now 
is a really strong idea of militant resistance because we can't just build these things and expect them to stay. We, have, we can only expect them to be under threat. We have to learn that you know, the, force, the forces of corporate takeover are everywhere. The forces of destruction are very much winning right now. And so whatever, whatever these new things we build, um, I think that one of the things we have to leave far behind us is this idea that progress is inevitable, that the march of progress is steady, that good things just happen. You know, it's this whole worldview of the enlightenment that just says, good things happen if you let powerful people do the right thing. Things will work out eventually. Eventually we'll end slavery. Eventually we'll get civil rights. That's wrong. The only way things change for the better is if we fight. Like nothing good ever happened without fighting. You know, and Frederick Douglass has said it and all the great revolutionaries have said it. But it's something that we really need to bake into our new common institutions, to our new economies and our new ways of doing things is whatever we become, that's not a consumer. It also has to be somebody who's really, we have to be willing to, to, to fight for these things and to defend them very strongly because that's, that's not just our present, that's, that's gonna always be the case. We're never just gonna win and then it's gonna be okay. That doesn't happen. The sum of the culture is the sum of resistance. And that's Ngugi uh, Nwath Yongo who said that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think with this uh, last part, we really uh, discussed a very important uh, dimension of, of uh, with the commons and, and building uh, strong alternatives that are able to resist uh, market at attacks of market uh, actors. Uh, so in a way, I think it's a good time for now uh, closing this webinar. The good thing is we could stay on for still two hours and have an, an info, a very uh, informative talk. But uh, yeah, we all are spending so much time behind these screens. So I think uh, it's a good way of ending here. I really want to thank both of you, Julia and Yap. And I think, uh, Yap, you inspired me for my uh, closing remarks, as you said. Uh, you have, you have journalists and you have scientists, uh, but I think uh, what we really need is kind of uh, journalists and scientists that are very good in their job, but at the same time are engaged with society. And I think both of you are really, a really inspiring, uh, leading example of this, not just sitting behind your desk, writing, researching, and then be happy, but really having the, feeling this responsibility to engage in public debates, uh, I think, uh, that's yes, really, uh, yeah, it give, really gives me uh, energy to listen to you. So uh, many thanks. Um, so final, this uh, webinar has been recorded. So if Julia and Yap finds it's okay, we can uh, make it available on the internet. And also I want to point you out to the fact that with the Green European Foundation and Oikos, we, have, we are now finishing uh, a paper on uh, just transition, uh, climate jobs and, and uh, justice, and uh, we will send you the link. I think it will come online next week. So it's Friday afternoon. Let me wish you all a nice weekend and some time free of uh, work and other things and enjoy your family and nature. Thank you very much.